Good morning, Fusion Church. Welcome to this October 31st, <clears throat> last day of the month of October. Uh, we are soaping today in 1 Chronicles 16, 1 Chronicles 16. And for those who haven't got their soap cards uh, on Sunday, uh, we will be in 1 Chronicles 17 tomorrow. And uh, if you go on the website tomorrow morning, you can print out a soap guide if you don't have one. Uh, but we're hoping today in First Chronicles 16, uh, as always tomorrow, uh, 9 a.m. is prayer and worship at the EHT location. Uh, that'll be live, and also you can watch it online. And then tomorrow night is um, Revival Prayer at 6.30 p.m. Uh, online. I'll post the Zoom information uh, in the chat. And then, uh, unfortunately, this... Uh, well, in a good way, I guess. The clocks fall back this Saturday, so you get an extra hour of sleep. Um, but you'll lose it again in the spring, so it's not really that great. So um, it catches up with you. Um, but that's what's happening. We're in First Chronicles 16. Everyone that's jumping on board this morning, welcome. Uh, 9 a.m. prayer and worship happens tomorrow, uh, live at EHT or online, <clears throat> and then 6.30 p.m. tomorrow's revival prayer. And then, uh, as I said just a moment ago, we will be setting the clocks back this Saturday into Sunday morning, um, saying that as a reminder, so don't be late for church on Sunday. You'll arrive uh, uh, what after everybody else is uh, already there, about an hour later. So we have Pastor John unmuted. Morning, Mike. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? Pretty good. How are you? Very good. Looks like you're ready awesome. to take a ride out on your boat out there in the water. Yeah, I was uh, in the north end of Wildwood and got that picture from a fourth floor uh, project that I was working on. Okay. The, uh, <clears throat> um, the inlet is, I think it's the, I can't remember the name of it, but it's uh, gotten closed in with all the storms that we had and there were some people out there surveying to make sure that they, they're going to dredge that real soon and open oh, okay. that back up. So it's a lot of a lot of uh, beach sand had got in the inlet, made it really hard to navigate. So okay, that'll eventually change. So um, there you go. <clears throat> so we uh sunrise seven twenty five a.m. Sir, so did you say up? did you say that how late? Is the sun, is it 7.30 is the max? Yeah, 7.30 is the max. It'll be this uh, Saturday, and then we'll fall back to 6.30 um, on Monday or, yeah, Sunday. So Okay. And then sunset is 5.58 uh, today. So that's, uh, I think Saturday is the shortest day of the year for sunlight, I believe, if I'm not okay. mistaken. Well, it's coming, it'll come back, Mike, as you said. Yeah. Yes, it will. It will come back. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we'll get that little extra hour of sleep this Saturday, mm. and then and for those jumping on board, we are in First Chronicles sixteen this morning in our soap. First Chronicles sixteen in our soap. Um, if you haven't got the soap guide, it'll be on the website tomorrow. But we'll be in First Chronicles seventeen tomorrow, um, so you, <clears throat> you don't have to worry about missing out, and then you can download it tomorrow. Um, soap guides were handed out on Sunday at church uh, for November, uh, but I just checked this morning. It is not there yet. It will get posted in the morning or later this evening. So uh, soaping in First Chronicles 16 this morning. Looking forward to Pastor John's message. Um, we have 9 a.m. prayer and worship happening tomorrow at EHT. And then tomorrow uh, that's live or online. And then tomorrow evening we have revival prayer. Mm -hmm. At 6.30 via Zoom, that will be posted in the chat. Looking forward to that. So we are coming up on 6 o'clock. Pastor John, it is now all you. Okay. Thank you, Michael, for getting us up and running here. Good morning, everybody on the screen here. Good to see each of you uh, as we have an opportunity again to get together as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And we have the privilege of opening God's word and allowing him to speak not just words back there, but allow him to move on these words and make them present tense for each of us. So let's stretch it a minute, give you a moment to uh, 
loosen up. I don't know, maybe some of you folks are loose already, but it always helps to stretch and lift your arms to the Lord. So let's pray <clears throat> as we jump in. Lord, we just want to thank you again for the opportunity uh, to gather in your name, uh, to fellowship with you, and Lord, to, to get to know you through the book that you wrote. We know, Lord, the Bible is just not a, a list of doctrines, uh, a list of commands, or a list of promises. It's a book that invites us into a relationship with you. And so we just pray, Lord, as we look at First Chronicles 16, that it would all center around you, that you would be center stage. And Holy Spirit, that you would open our hearts and our minds and our spirits uh, to see our God in a fresh and a brand new way. So, Father, we thank you, and we come with an expectant spirit to meet you. And it's in your name we ask it, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's read it. First Chronicles 16. And they brought in the ark of God, and they placed it inside the tent, which David had pitched for it. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. When David had finished offering the burnt offering, and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. And he distributed to every one of Israel, both man and woman, to every one a loaf of bread and a portion of meat and a raisin cake. And he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord, even to celebrate and to thank and praise the Lord, God of Israel. Asaph, the chief, and the second to him, Zechariah, then Jeel, then Shermamoth, Jehiel, Madathan, Eliab, Beniah, Obadom, and Jael, with musical instruments, harps, lyres. Also, Asa played loud sounding cymbals. Beniah and Jehiel. The priests blew trumpets continually before the Ark of the Covenant of God. Then on that day, David first assigned Asaph and his relatives to give thanks to the Lord. And it's a beautiful thing that they put together as they worship the Lord. So here's where they go. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Speak of all his wonders, glory in his holy name, that the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his wonderful deeds, which he has done, his marvels, and the judgments from his mouth. O seed of Israel, his servant, sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Remember his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac. And he confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as a portion of your inheritance. When they were only a few in number, very few and strangers in it, and they wandered about from nation to nation and from king, one kingdom to another people. He permitted no one to oppress them. He reproved kings for their sake, saying, do not touch my anointed ones and do not uh, do my prophets any harm. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering. Come before him. Worship the Lord in holy array. Tremble before him all the earth. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. 
Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea roar in all it contains. Let the field exalt and all that's in it. Then the trees of the forest will sing for joy before the Lord. For he's coming to judge the earth. Oh, go thanks to the Lord. He is good for his loving kindness is everlasting. Then say, save us, O oh God, of our salvation. Gather us and deliver us from the nations to give thanks to thy holy name and glory in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting even to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praised the Lord. So he left Asaph and his relatives there before the ark of the covenant of the Lord to minister before the ark continually as every day's work required. And Obadam, with his 68 relatives, Obadam also the son of Jehotha and Hosa, the gatekeepers, and he left Zadok, the priest, and his relatives, the priests before the tabernacle of the Lord in the high place, which was at Gibeon, to offer burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar of burnt offering continually, morning and evening, even according to all that's written in the law of the Lord, which he commanded to Israel. And with them were Haman and Jithaha and the rest of all who were chosen who were designated by name to give thanks to the Lord because his loving kindness is everlasting. And with them were Heman and Jethaha with trumpets and cymbals for those who should sound loud and with instruments for the songs of God and the songs of Jethaha for the gate. Then all the people departed each to his house and David returned to bless his household. Amen. Okay, so as we look at this chapter, uh, it's rich with many ideas, but I want to center in basically on three today. Number one, uh, we are called as God's people to worship the Lord for who he is. That's first point. Second point, we're to give thanks to the Lord for all that he's done and accomplished for us. And thirdly, uh, we're called to continually seek his face. In other words, to stay in constant fellowship with him throughout the day. So the context, uh, I think, as you see here, is right there in 16.1. They brought the ark of God. Okay, that's where God's presence is represented. And they placed it inside the tent, which David had pitched for it. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. So they're just celebrating. This is a big deal. Uh, the ark represents the very presence of God. They're bringing it into Jerusalem and placing it in this tent, which later is going to be replaced by a temple. Uh, and they are there and they are celebrating the Lord big time with all kind of instruments and cymbals and trumpets and the whole bit. I mean, it is a celebration par excellence. And I want us to see, uh, you know, what, what is this all about? As they were doing this, I, I think, number one, it represents praise. And as I'm, I'm talking about praise and thanksgiving and God's presence, I'm going to be jumping back and forth throughout this particular chapter. So it's going to be right there, but we're going to jump from verse here and there to kind of look at these topically on what they're around. So first thing, is the big deal is to worship God just because of who he is, just for who he is. Uh, and they're encouraged to do this. Let me give you a couple of verses. Look at nine. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Look at verse 23. Sing to the Lord all the earth. The entire earth is called to worship the Lord. Look at 28. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Again, this is all worship. If you look at 31, uh, he goes further, and he's actually calling nature to celebrate. Not just human beings, but all creation. 31, let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. 
Look at 32. He's calling again all aspects of nature to celebrate God. Let the sea roar and all it contains. Let the field exalt and all that's in it. Then the trees of the forest will sing for joy before the Lord. So there's a tremendous celebration here for who he is. But as we, as we kind of unpack this chapter, we get a picture of, okay, who is this God that you and I are called to worship? We're not worshiping some idol that's dead. We're worshiping a living God, but, but who exactly is he? And if you want, if you want to jot some of these things down that describe him first, uh, we see in verse 25 is he's great for great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Uh, we're told, uh, as we saw before, that he made the heavens. He made all this gigantic universe, billions, trillions of stars, galaxies that are spinning around. He made them all. Not only did it say he made the heavens, but we all know he made the earth. If you look at the beginning part of Genesis, he made the earth. He made everything in it. He made every human being. He made every animal. He made every plant. And this psalmist is calling us, in a sense here, to celebrate that God is great. He is gigantically big, even beyond our wildest emotions. goes a little bit further. Uh, if you go and look at 27, it says, Splendor and majesty are before him. Splendor and majesty. When I think of splendor and majesty, uh, back a ways, uh, my first wife, Barbara, and I took a trip out west, and we, we went to Yosemite. I don't know if anybody's gone to Yosemite uh, National Park. Amazing. You see these gigantic mountains and pieces of rock. Uh, you, you begin to see uh, the majesty when you go to the beach, and sometimes you see the waves and the big waves, and they're crashing in. It kind of almost takes your breath away that God is majestic. When I think of majesty, I think of when we look out our windows and we see these gigantic lightning bolts and storms and thunders crashing. God is not a little God. He's majestic. He's splendory. Splendory. Hmm. Splendorous. Whatever he is. But he's good and he's big. So he's great. We know that he has splendor and majesty. Uh, also, uh, we look at the end of 27. Uh, he's a God who has strength. He has strength. He has all power. Nothing is impossible for the God we worship. Let me say that again. I don't know what you might be facing in your life. Some kind of a trial, heartache, pain, and it just seems to be a big mountain before you. The Bible indicates that he's able to move mountains. He can do things that are way out of our ability to comprehend. He can do the impossible. So he has all strength and power. But it goes on a little bit further. Uh, it says, and joy are in his place. I don't know if you've ever thought of it, but God is an extremely joyful personality. In fact, as we look at the Bible, we, we know that God is one God, but he has three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I think God has joy just because of who he is individually. The Father has joy just because he's the father and the son has joy just because he's the son and the spirit has joy just because he is the Holy Spirit. So I think they have joy just because they're perfect, but I think they also have joy because they enjoy each other. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but the Trinity is continually enjoying each other. They just plain enjoy being with each other. And I think they also have tremendous joy because they live to give, to pour out of themselves. So they live to bless other beings. And if you want to experience joy, and I don't know anybody here, I don't believe on the screen that would not want to experience a supernatural divine joy, then I would just take, take time in your day to receive the love of God that he's pouring out. It's, he's like the sunshine. He's perpetually pouring out like sunbeams coming on the earth. He's pouring out his love and he encourages us to receive that love, and he encourages them 
to love him back with all our hearts and to love every other person we come up in contact with that same love. God is joyful and he wants us to be able to experience the joy, you and I, by experiencing his love and then worshiping him back and passing it on. So God's great. He's splendid. He's majestic. He's strong. He's joyful. If you look at verse 10, we see something else he is. Glory in his holy name. Glory in his holy name. <laughs> if you look at the bottom of verse 29, worship the Lord in holy array. The word actually holy there in the Hebrew means set apart. Meaning there's no other being in the entire universe like God. He's set apart. He's in a class all by himself. And in that being all by himself, he's absolutely perfect. There's no darkness in him. He's total light. We know the Bible says he's perfect. He has no sin. He's without defect. They're just, we never experienced um, something like that in our normal everyday life. But we know in the Bible when certain people encountered him, and experienced his holiness, not just in their minds, but in their being, they were radically shaken. If you look at Isaiah 6, Isaiah has a vision of God on his throne, and he basically says, whoa, because he hears the angel saying, holy, 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 and literally he says, I'm falling apart. It's like I'm overwhelmed. If you see Moses when he encounters God at the burning bush, again, he hides his face and the Lord says to him, hey, Moses, take, take your sandals off. You're on holy ground. Moses doesn't flippantly stretch out his hand and say, hey, good to meet you, God. No, no, he's, he's shaking. He's, he's on his face in a sense. If you look at John, the disciple, who in the Bible says leaned on Jesus' breast when Jesus was on the earth, but when he encounters Jesus in the book of Revelation, he's totally overwhelmed and speechless because he's encountered the direct holiness of God, and it's overwhelming. So as we're thinking of worshiping God, he is a holy God. In fact, because he's holy, it can cause us to do something. If you look at verse 30, tremble before him, all the earth. Tremble, tremble before him. In other words, when we encounter the maker of the heavens and the earth face on, it, it causes us to shake. It, it, it's, it's an out-of-body experience in a sense. It says tremble before him. In 25, uh, it says at the end of 25, he also is to be feared above all gods. Not fear that I'm going to get a lightning bolt, but just fear like I'm in the presence of an unbelievably perfect, holy, majestic God. And my response is, wow, wow, I need to worship him. Another aspect of who we worship God for who he is, uh, is the fact we know he's a God of justice. If you look at verse 14, he's the Lord, our God. His judgments are in all the earth. God is a judge, and we know if we look at the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, there's going to come a day when Jesus is coming back, and who knows how close that could be with everything that's going on over in Israel and Palestine. We don't know. But we do know, if you look at the book of Revelation, when Jesus comes back, he's coming not as a meek little lamb. He's coming as a lion, and there will be judgments on the earth. And those that are rebellious against the Lord will bow their knee and they will submit to Jesus as the King of Kings and as the Lord of Lords. So we're to worship him as the one who is just and will execute judgment perfectly, not only in the end times, but even in our everyday life. We also know uh, that he reigns. Look at verse 31. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. 
Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Talking about the book of Revelation, you look at that, and the, what I love about the book of Revelation is chapter 4. It says, in the heavens there is a throne, and the Father is sitting on that throne. And it's saying that basically God is in control of every single thing that's happened on this planet. The whole thing that's going on in Israel doesn't get God by surprise. He knows it. He's known that from the beginning of creation. And not only does he know it, but he's in perfect control. And from what we see biblically, nothing can happen on this planet. Nothing can happen in your life or my life either unless God literally causes it to happen or he permits it to happen. It's just amazing. I'm just so glad that this world isn't a, 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 a world of just kind of accidents. I know a pastor friend of mine that said this. He says, God never says, oops, like, uh-oh, missed that one. No, he doesn't miss nothing. He's on the throne, and he knows what he's doing with nations, but he also knows what he's doing in each life on the screen. He is totally calling the shots on this planet. And here's another neat thing to worship him for. Uh, yes, he reigns, and he reigns because he's also wanting to bring his goodness to pass on the planet. If you look at verse 34, going back and forth here. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is what? Good. Wow. He is good. I know my wife, Kathy, here on the screen constantly one of her major refrains in her bible study is hey the bottom line the bottom line in anybody's life is do you really really believe that god is good so there's a, a homework assignment for you when we get done the soap ask yourself not just on the top up here what do you really believe at the bottom of your heart do you believe god's good do you believe he's for you or do you think he's against you? If God's good, that means he will always, always do what's best. And that's tough for us sometimes because our idea of best is many times different than God's idea of best. But here we are to worship him because he's good and he is always, always seeking to put a blessing out to us. Sometimes we don't understand how they operate but he wants to bless us with his goodness. But not only that, 34, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he's good. His loving kindness is everlasting. So the other factor of who God is we worship is that he's loving. He's loving. He, he longs to give. God's not so much I, I want and get, get, get for me. It's like I want to give. I want to bless. I want to comfort. I want to support. I want to encourage. That's who God is. Just one more. Well, two more, actually. That he's a covenant-keeping God. Look back at 15. Remember his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham, his oath to Isaac, God has made many covenants. He made them to the Israelites. But not only did he make a covenant with the Israelites, he made a covenant with us as Christians. The new covenant in his blood was we take communion. And God always keeps his covenant. He always keeps his promises. And we're to worship him for that. And the last, and I could go on, but to wrap this part up, verse 35. Then say, save us, O God of our salvation. We're to worship him because the Lord saves us. He saves us from predicaments, but particularly he saves us from our sin, from our guilt. As Pastor Brennan was saying on Sunday, he saves us from our shame. He saves us from everything that makes our life miserable and tries to tear us apart. He saves us and he wants to put us back together. So we are called to be people of praise. And I think a, a, a psalm that just highlights this so, so well is Psalm 150. Kind of kind of fills out the passion of what I've been trying to say. Listen to what it says here. Psalm 150. 
Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the trumpet, with the harp, the lyre, with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with stringed instruments. Praise him. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So that's what I see, number one, in First Chronicles 16. We are to be caught up, infatuated, overcome with worship of our mighty God. And that makes me ask myself, am I in that attitude in my daily life? Is that the way I live? Do I take time each day to, to, to say, God, I worship you for who you are. You're worthy of my praise. You're worthy of my worship. Are we worshipers? Not just where we're going to get now, giving thanks for what he's, what he's done. I mean, we're going to do that now, but even more than thanking God for what he's done, it's do we enjoy God for who he is, irregardless of anything that he is doing per se. So we're to worship him for who he is. Number two, we are to thank him for what he's done for us. Uh, look at verse eight. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known, here it is, his deeds among the nations. Look at the end of nine. Speak of all his wonders. Look at verse 12. Remember his wonderful deeds, which he's done, his marvels and the judgments from his mouth. O seed of Israel, his servant, sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. Remember, it says, remember, remember, remember his deeds. Goes on a little bit further. Verse 24. At the end, his wonderful deeds among the people. Tell of his glory. Tell of his wonderful, wonderful deeds deeds. I mean, there's a lot of deeds, a lot of deeds as we look at the Bible. Uh, some biggies. Uh, we know in the book of Exodus, God did amazing deeds. All these plagues he sent upon Egypt to bring Egypt to his knees. God did amazing things. He opened up the Red Sea. Talk about a miracle. We say, oh, well, that's nice. And then we move on. Hey, if you were there, and you saw the Red Sea open, your mouth would be open and wide, and so would mine, saying, wow. It blew them away at that point. Not only that, he gave them 10 commandments. And we know in the Bible that he, he was there to meet their every need in the wilderness. He supplied water. He supplied manna. He supplied meat. He gave them a pillar uh, a fire by night to lead them, a, a cloud by day to lead them. He was leading them every step of the way. Uh, pretty cool here. Their clothes and their shoes didn't wear out. And I think we're told here from Asaph, a man like, remember what he did. Israelites, remember, 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 remember. Now, if you got a pen, write these down. The, there are a couple Psalms. And Nehemiah, if you look at these Psalms together, I just did that the other day, and I was totally blown away of how big God is and what he did for Israel and what Israel did not do as they whined and complained and what they should have done, which was to trust and obey. Uh, but have you, when you have a chance, read these Psalms together. Psalm 78, Psalm 105, Psalm 106 and Nehemiah 9. And if you see them together, you're going to see that God is saying Israel was an object lesson to the entire world of who he was, of his desire for fellowship with that nation, of his desire to meet their every need, of his call for them to trust and obey. And as we see these Psalms uh, and Nehemiah, we see just amazingly how big he is and not only his care for Israel, but literally, he's saying, what I did for Israel, now people of 2023, I want you to know what I did for them, I'll do for you, but I'm asking you to trust me 
and I'm asking you to obey. It's amazing uh, to me uh, to remember what he's done. And all these things, you know, you say, well, that's Old Testament. Guess what? The God that opened the Red Sea, the one who supplied food for them in the wilderness, is the same God we worship. So when it says recount your deeds, this is not just for Israelites, folks, this is for Christians as well. We're to go back in our history that starts back in Exodus, and we as Christians are to give thanks for these things. And we can add on to that to give thanks for the life of Christ, for the, give thanks for the cross that he died for our sins, give thanks he was resurrected from the dead, that we have eternal life. So, very clearly, I hear the psalmist saying we are to be a people of thanksgiving, not just at thanksgiving time, but it should be a characteristic of our life all the time. I like somebody said, it's not thanksgiving, it's thanks living. It's an every day. And if you're like me at times, you got to catch yourself because we can be like the Israelites and we can, can whine at times and we can complain at times and we can grumble at times and we just get a bad attitude. And yet I, I hear the Lord saying, hey, where is your focus? Are you going to focus on what's wrong and what you don't have? Or are you going to focus on what you do have? And are you going to count your blessings? I really believe it. People can see a glass half empty. Or they can see a glass half full. So I, I ask you, I ask me, what's your focus? And what's your attitude? What's my attitude? Am I always looking for the glass half empty? Oh, man, this didn't happen, or that didn't happen, and this went wrong, and that person did it, and all this wine, and just all I could see is negative. Or am I a person looking for the positive, say, hey, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you gave me health. I'm moving around. Thank you, Lord. I have a roof over my head. I'm not like out in the middle of no man's land in Palestine. Thank you, Lord. I have food for my stomach. Lord, I thank you for my family. Lord, I thank you for my friends. I thank you, Lord, for my church. I think you kind of get the hang of it. So I think it's a big deal. Is the glass half empty or half full? So, so far, I think the Lord is saying in this chapter, man, worship me. Get to know me for who I am. Enjoy me, my people. And then I hear the Lord saying, secondly, give thanks for the blessings. They're coming to you every day. And the last thing is, it says, seek the Lord's face. Verse 11, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. First Thessalonians 5, 17, it says, pray without ceasing. So what's it mean to seek his face continually, to pray without ceasing? I mean, does that mean like all day long, I'm on my knees and I have my eyes shut and for 24 hours a day, all day, well, I got to sleep. So 16 hours a day, I just got to be here. And I'm just, I'm just praying all day long like this. Well, guess what? It can't mean that because there's stuff we have to do. You know, I have to go to work. I have to clean the house. I have to cut the grass. I have to pay bills. I got to do all this stuff. So what's it mean to seek his face continually? To pray without ceasing? I think what the Lord says is just Involve me in your everyday life all day long. Just let's fellowship all day long. Let's dialogue back and forth. Why don't you talk to me throughout the day? Why don't you let me talk to you through the day? In a sense, let's hang out with each other. In other words, as we go through the day, um, a picture that helps me sometimes of the Holy Spirit, if you've ever seen... <clears throat> some twins that are joined at the hip. They're literally, they're, they're two people, but they're joined at the hip. And it's almost like a picture to me. It reminds me like all day long, I'm not doing the day by myself. There's somebody right there hooked with me, the Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How do we stay in touch all day long? Well, I, I feel it's just so important to start the day with devotions, to start. I do not want to just roll out of bed run in, take a shower, run out, go to work, 
and hustle and bustle, and I'm going to be a miserable person. For me, I personally have to tune in. I need to get my mind off me and on the Lord. And the best way I know to do that is by prayer and by Bible study. So I think the Lord encourages, start the day with him, interact with him in prayer and Bible study. But then throughout the day, interact with him. I think we're all guilty at sometimes I start my day with prayer. Okay, good. Got a good devotions. I lose God the whole part of the day, and then I say my prayers at night. I've lost him throughout the day. And I think it's extremely important. I know it is for me to try to bring him into my everyday life, to be able to praise him at times. You wake up, and I can't look out here and say, well, Lord, I praise you for a beautiful sunrise, because obviously hey, it's not out there. But there's sometimes you can wake up and look out and say, wow, this is beautiful. We worship you, Lord. I think there's times you can just drive in and you're driving to work or whatever. You feel good that day. You feel strong. We say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for a good night's sleep. And you're driving along and maybe you hear an ambulance going on and you just say, okay, hey, Lord, just be with that person. Or again, you're driving to work and a thought comes to your mind. Hey, uh, I, I need to pray for Bill. I know he has a need. So it's, it's intertwining your entire day with times of worship, with times of giving thanks, with praying for other people, with telling the Lord, hey, Lord, I, I'm in a hot spot at the moment. Would you please help me? It's all day long. And the best way I've tried to do that is I try to bring the Lord into the next transition of my life. So, okay, I'm doing a Bible study now. I stop. Okay, Lord, be with me now. I'm going to do some study. Uh, Lord, I get done the studying. Okay, I'm going to try to get back and get a little bit of sleep because I get up early today. Okay, Lord, just let me rest in you. I wake up. Okay, Lord, what do you want to do the rest of the morning? Uh, and then, you know, you're literally, every time you do one activity, you end it, bring him into the next activity. You follow what I'm saying? Let's say in a day, we have 50 different activities, anything from taking the kids to soccer, to doing the wash, uh, to paying a, a bill, whatever. But every time there's a transition from one activity to the other, bring the Lord into the next activity. And I have to add quickly, to me, man, it's so easy for me to forget to do that. I want to do that. So I have to get to the point of saying, Lord, would you remind me to bring you into the next activity. In a sense, Lord, by your grace, pull me back. I'm so easy to wander away from your presence. Uh, and I like uh, what somebody said, we need to form a holy habit of interacting with God all day long. And there's two books I'd recommend uh, that I think encourage me in this. One is Practicing the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. It's backed by a, a Catholic monk and priest, but his aim was just to be with the Lord all day long. And it's so beautiful because he said at the end, he says, you know, God's as real to me as I do the dishes in the kitchen as when I'm taking the sacrament of Holy Communion. Everything became holy because he brought God into everything. And one other book that's more of a modern idea on that concept uh, is a book called Present Perfect by Gregory Boyd. Present Perfect, Gregory Boyd, B-O-Y-D. And I love what he says. He says, just remember, every moment of every day, the love of God is coming towards you. The next time you think, the love of God is coming toward me. And he, he unpacks that uh, about, again, how to bring God into the everyday of your life. But this is just a rich chapter, and I just pray we can all grow in our worship of enjoying God for just how beautiful he is, that we can begin to get a grateful spirit instead of grumbling and complaining, and that we can learn to interact with God all day long, so that literally he becomes our best friend. What I've found, and I close with this, is that the more I can bring him into the everyday, the more real he becomes. 
the more we interact with him all day long, the more real he becomes. He's not just somebody up there, out there, wherever. He's right here with us. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for First Chronicles 16. I pray, Father, that you would inspire us to worship you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are an amazing God. So breathe the spirit of worship into us. And I pray, Lord, uh, that you would give us a, a heart of gratitude and thanksgiving. Lord, not just on Thanksgiving month in November, but may that be a lifestyle that we, 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 we give thanks in everything, even in our struggles, knowing you want to bring good out of them. And Lord, we just pray. I pray for grace for each of my brothers and sisters. Lord, it's so easy to wander, so easy to get distracted. I just pray, Lord, like a gigantic magnet that you keep pulling us back to you. Keep pulling us back into a relationship, into a fellowship, into a friendship with you. So, Father, we thank you for the good things you're doing. And we just celebrate your name today. And we ask you, Jesus, in your strong name. Amen. Amen. Have a great day, folks. God bless you all. Amen.